All right. And there's been more than a little bit of uneasiness when it comes to the subject. Um, there are some strong feelings going in different directions and all that kind of stuff. But I have gone on this trek with you since last night to focus on something that I don't think we've been doing a whole lot of. And that is focusing on the person that this is all about. And what unfortunately we do, we do the same. I mean, I see this in the classroom. The first day of school, there's someone that's going to sit there and say, Mr. Van, what does it take to get an A in your class? I can remember when I was at Pacific Union College sitting in the biology department and there was 102 or more in that class and one student who happens to be a relative of mine by marriage was fighting over the only point he missed on the test. And the rest of us were saying, thank you so much, I passed. And I'm sitting there going, sometimes we, we just, it's just like, we, we, we get so caught up in getting a goal or passing or getting a grade or whatever else like that. And I'll be honest, the world doesn't make it very easy. Because if you don't get A's in certain places, you're not going to get the job. You know that. That's nothing new. And so, so oftentimes, we don't sense it at times, but there are many of us that have experienced this. Wait a minute here. I learned something. I have had students that don't get necessarily good grades, but they're brilliant. And they've proven themselves brilliant in their jobs and all of those things because they learned it. They did more things. I had a student that just talked to me at church. He is a, he's studying to be a nurse. He has failed the, the actual test three times. He says, now I'm working as a nurse and my, my reports are very well, very high, but I can't pass the test. And then he says, well, I wish that they would just give me a, a class so I could learn how to take the test so I could get more money and all that other kind of stuff. And I don't disagree with grades and, uh, you know, I mean, th that kind of thing. But the problem is, is that we're not becoming any better societies when we're sitting there just pushing for, for grades instead of how we treat people. At least it's got to be balanced. And, and I'll be honest, I mean, you read the newspapers, you hear the news. Are we doing well as a society? As a free society? No. I don't think so. Can we? I believe so. This is, this is not hopelessness. That's not what it is. But I think that God has much better plans. If we've seen all of the things that God has been doing for us up until now, I would like to sit there and take the challenge and say, well, what does he have to say about the judgment? And then I found what I believe is a parallel. And that parallel is how, Jesus, how Joseph treats his brothers. When they come to Egypt, you know, he recognized who they are immediately and he knows all of the problems that he had 17 years before that. And so I want us to kind of go through that and, and get some thinking. And I'll be honest, you know, um, I'm just giving you what I found. Okay? But I, I have studied it, I've gone over it, and I honestly believe that it's biblical. It's there. I mean, it doesn't take away from anything that, that we have said, but it, the emphasis is on a different syllable. Instead of being syllable, it's syllable. It's the same word. It's just that I'm reusing, I'm emphasizing the wrong part of the, set, the word to make any sense out of it. That's all I'm saying. So, this is not changing anything. I'm just simply changing what happens when God actually gets involved in this and we see it from his perspective. And that excites me. So I'd like to share that with you. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, this is your meeting. This is not mine. And if 
things need to be heard, then please make it sure that it gets out. Please, that we will understand for the first time, we'll look and say, Lord, it's too long. You deserve to receive your reward. You receive your success. You have been patient with us. You have worked with us. You have given everything that heaven has to get us back. But you won't force us there. And we need to know how to cooperate with you. And so I ask that you will bless us as we go through this special meeting, that we will understand what you are trying to tell us about what it means to come home. And so I ask that you will guide and send us your Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Joseph and his brothers. When you look at Genesis 37 to 45, you find out that these boys have an incredible amount of baggage that they bring down to Egypt. We went over that this last meeting. And when you look at it, you'll see several things that they have had. We've talked about the mother issue. We talked about the the birthright issue. We have um, just... So many different things that, that these boys have been, let's, let's be humble here, confused. They don't know what's supposed to be happening. They see it around them all around. Everybody else seems to be doing the same kind of stuff like that. So, you know, I guess that's the way it is. But it's not fair and we want, you know, justice and we want all of these kinds of things and it's just not right. Now, <clears throat> When you look at the story in Genesis 37, and let's just look at that for just a minute. Genesis 37, I want you to look at the end, the last two or three verses, and I want you to think as a son of of Jacob that you are going to tell your father a lie. Now, I want you to think about what they're doing to make this happen. And we're going to see it. So they see Joseph coming and, oh, brother, oh, here comes daddy's little spy. Okay? You know, what's he going to do? And he's wearing that jacket. Oh, it, it just rankles their mind. You've got, you've got to know this. I mean, this, this is humanity. This is, this is nothing new. They've put up with this little kid all the time. And, and for them, this guy is just the epitome of, I can't stand it. Dad's doing this. Mom's not getting treated right. We are not getting what we should be doing. And they're just there. And here comes Joseph. Little Peter and the wolf there, you know. Um, The point being is, is that he's just coming along and all of a sudden here's daddy's little spy. They come up and before he can really say a whole lot, they take the jacket off and throw him in a pit. Now, their plan is to leave him there to die. And I have come across some rabbis that have thrown a little bit of insight into some of this kind of stuff. There is mentioned in Genesis 37 that when Joseph gets picked up, there are two groups that are there. There are Midianites there. No. Ishmaelites. Thank you. There are Ishmaelites, but then there's the Midianites. Okay, And the suggestion is is that the Midianites actually took Joseph out of that. The brothers were going to sell him, but the Midianites seemed to have gotten there before they did and then sold him to the Ishmaelites who were actually going down south. Now, here's the interesting part. Who are the Ishmaelites? Who's daddy? Ishmael. Ah, the other son instead of Isaac. Who are the Midianites? No, the Midianites are no. Yeah, that's right. They, they, they no, they're Esau. Yeah, that's correct. That's what it was because I was mixing up the Moabites. Moabites are a lot. Okay. Anyway, so th- this is these are ultimately cousins of sort. Okay. This is the kind of stuff that they have. Okay. So now, so they get him going down. Now, how are they going to go back and say, you know, they could say nothing. Okay. Have you ever thought about the options? 
You've got to think, I've got a, a worksheet if you want to look at it. It's, it's a really nice little worksheet that I have my students use. All the options that you could have, and then you rank them, and then see, you know, well, what would work and what wouldn't work. Okay, they could say, absolutely, hey, Dad, where's, where's Joseph? What? He, you, you sent him to see us? I didn't see him. Well, well what happened? Well, when, did, when did you send him out? They could have told him that story. Why didn't they? That would be easy, yeah. Then they'd have to go look for him. Ah! And there's a possibility he could be found. Uh, so, yeah. um, you know, he could be found. If, if, if he was, yeah, for him. there you go, absolutely. By his dad, so that he needs to be dead, so it cuts off, you know, yeah. all possibility. Okay, I'll be honest, that's the first time I've ever heard that, but yes, absolutely. This is, this is good, okay? All right. Instead, I mean, instead of doing something like this, they have to do something, okay? So they take the jacket and tear it up and all that kind of stuff, put blood on it, kid's blood, okay? And then they bring it up. And what do they say to their father? They found his coat. Huh? They found his coat. Yeah, but what are the words? They specifically say something. Well, they said, take a look at it and decide if it's your son's coat or not. Do you recognize the coat? To recognize. Now, I want you to know that Hebrews love to play with words. There's only one other place where that same word is used that same way. Do you know where it is? It's in the next chapter. Tamar, who was a Canaanite, and what you got to look, and I'll go really briefly through Genesis 38. Judah was the one who said, let's sell him. Okay? So, and he seems to be the leader all the way through this whole thing. Okay? Reuben would like to, but he never gets it. But everybody believes Joseph, Judah, so they do that. So here's the interesting part. He leaves where everybody is. He leaves the camp and goes and marries a Canaanite woman. Oh, wow, that's just like Uncle Esau, which kind of takes him out of the running for the birthright. Okay? So then he has three kids by this woman, and the oldest wants to get married, so he finds Tamar to marry her, but he's such an evil man, he ends up dying. Um, the second one's supposed to take the lever at marriage and sit there and says, I'm going to give you a child so you will not be considered a worthless woman. And he, he dies. And so Judah has to decide, is he going to give his little boy, you know, when he grows up to them? Or is he afraid that maybe his son's not going to do that either? He's going to leave and have no sons. Okay? So this gets really, really interesting. So he sleeps with Tamar. She sets this thing all up. And she's just trying to get, you know, because she's going to be left at home. She's unmarriageable. She is still supposed to. To, to marry the only son of Judah, and Judah's not doing it. He's not making it happen. So she takes law into her own hands, and he sits and dresses up like a prostitute and sleeps with him, but says, and she's really careful about that, she says, for three things, what does she want? I want your signet ring, I want your staff, and I want your coat. Why? Because she knows that if he finds out, she's dead. So what happens? He finds out that this has happened because she can't find her to pay her off. And so all of a sudden, you know, he, he says, oh, did you know that your uh, espoused uh, daughter-in-law was sleeping with other people? Oh, she deserves to be burned. She needs to be burned. This is bad news. And so she sends quietly the signet ring, the staff, which happens to be his credit cards, Okay, that's really what identifies who he is and what he's there. And she says, these belong to the man who's the father of my child. Do you recognize these? <laughs> Uses the same words that they played on daddy. And he says, you are more righteous than I am. And what happened was, is that Judah sat there and realized what he had done to his father. And he says, I refuse to do that again. 
And it's interesting because when he gets down to, to Egypt and he finally, in Genesis 44, he finally just opens up before his brother, who he doesn't know is his brother, he tells him the whole story. And you realize it's this and this. And only he, and here's the interesting part. I'm going to save it. So let's go. All right. So let's go to Genesis 42. No. No, I don't want that one. I want the story of Joseph. I think it's, I think it's 42. Yep. And I'm going to, I'm going to cut to the chase here because I, this, I took six weeks on this in a Bible study on Friday night and I just, we don't have time for that. Okay, so in other words, everybody but Benjamin goes down there <laughs> and take a look at it. Verse 7, And Joseph saw his brethren and them, made knew them, but made himself strange unto them and spoke roughly unto them. He recognized them, but they didn't recognize him. Now, the anonymity that Joseph has here puts him in a very unique position. It's like he's God. He knows everything about him. Not because he's God. It's because he's their brother and they don't know it. He's literally free to say and do whatever he jolly well wants to these boys. And he uses it to save them. Surprise. We would think to get back at them. And maybe that's the way we've looked at the story, but he didn't. He's not trying to get back to them. Okay? And the reason why is, is because all along, we're going to find out at the end why he was doing all of this. So they do this. All right, so here they come and they say, they roughly, and in verse 8 it says, Joseph knew his brethren, but they did not know him. And Joseph remembered his dreams, which were what? Remember about the stars and all that stuff? Okay. Did any of those, when you go through that story there, we usually think that those two stories that he had as a child at home and he told at the family table was the being that he was going to be in charge of them. Nothing suggested he was going to be the, the second in command in the country of Egypt. Neither one, either Joseph or his brothers or father or anybody ever thought that that actually meant he was going to be the number two man in Egypt. And he's going to tell you later on, he says, God, you didn't bring me down here. God brought me down here to save you. And you go, now that sounds like something that God would bless. You see, this is what's happening here. And I think sometimes we misread that a little bit. But here's the thing. He remembered the dreams which he dreamed to them. And he said unto them, what? Your spies. Where have we heard that before? That's what they called him. Here comes daddy's little spy. It's almost like he's recreating in some ways what happened to him. And what's in it for Joseph? These are my brothers. I don't know what's been happening, but they're here. And now he realizes why I'm here. I'm here. I am in a position to save my family from the drought. I'm here maybe to actually bring them back together as one. And this is running through his heads. And you've got to watch it. You watch how the story tells it. And you sit there just like we did with uh, that little quiz that we did. How did the ant go to the, to the water? How do you know? And you start seeing cause to effect, cause to effect. And you start seeing that. And you can't just do it on one idea. Remember, you've got to have a whole lot of circumstantial evidence to make it work. But I think it's there. You tell me if I'm wrong, but this is what it is. And he says, you're spies to see the nakedness of the land. You come. And they said, no, 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 my Lord, we came to buy food as servants. We are all one man's sons. What they, they, do they say now? We are honest men. You are? I don't remember that. 
See what's happening here? Why is it that Joseph is determined to find out as much as he possibly can about his, his brothers? Okay? So watch what happens here. They say, oh no, we are, we are uh, true men, servants. We are not spies. He says, no, you've come. He says, he says, we are servants. This is verse 13. Thy servants are 12 brethren. I only see 10. Oh, the one of the sons of the man is in the land of Canaan. The youngest is today with their father and one is not. What does that tell you? Do they know where that last one is? They don't know where Joseph is. And it doesn't necessarily say that he's died. We just, he's just, he's just vanished. That's really what they're saying. He's vanished. We don't, we don't know. No, he's probably there, but whatever. Okay. So Joseph is listening to all of this stuff. And then he says in verse 14, he says, nope, 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 you're spies. And to prove that, you're going to have to bring your youngest brother. Now, why in the world did he ask, well, how many, you know, he says, you say you're 12. There's only 10. He knows that he's one of them, but they don't. So he's figured, all right, so I know where Benjamin and he's back at home with dad. Oh, dad wouldn't let him come either. Ah, oh, I'm starting to learn a thing here too. Okay. He said, we're going to prove to see whether or not you're spies or not. So he puts them all in the prison for three days. Now, I want you to see some of the next education here. If you be true men, let one of your brethren be bound in the house of, of the, your prison and go and... Uh, carry the corn for the famine to your houses, but bring your youngest brother unto me, so shall your words be verified and you shall not die. So he's going to put him there and he says, okay, one person's going to go back and get the brother and then I'll believe you. Now how long is that going to take to do that? That's, that's some serious mileage there. Okay? So he only lets him stay for three days, but in the three days... Because he is anonymous, because he is acting as if, and he's not acting, it's just that he's in a position where he knows all the secrets because he knows who they are and he understands their language and they have no clue who he is. Now take a look what happens here. Verse 21, and they said to one another, we are verily guilty concerning our brother. Who are they referring to? Joseph, okay? In that we saw the anguish of his soul when he besought us and we would not hear, therefore is the distress come upon us. Who is punishing them? No. God is not punishing them. It's their guilt, people. It's their guilt. You see that? It's the guilt that's killing them. It's not God. It's not Joseph. He hears all of this stuff. And you go, wow. Can you imagine what that was like for Joseph? He now knows something that he didn't know before. For years, for 17 years, he didn't, he didn't hear this. And he sits there and he says, and we saw it. And Reuben, oh yeah, Reuben, remember? I told you, this is big brother, okay? Big brother saying, this. I spoke not, didn't I speak to you? I told you, don't sin against the child and you would not listen. Therefore, behold, his blood is required of us. Shame on you, older, younger brothers. You did this, all that kind of stuff. And Joseph hears all this. <laughs> He says, well, they haven't changed a whole lot. But I hope that they have. It's just like, but they know. Okay, so there's the guilt. There's the guilt. That has lasted for 17 years, people. You can't tell me that this is one serious issue with these boys. Okay? What do you think Joseph thinks? They don't even know this is Joseph. They just think that the stranger... Has, what God kind of is who say you know fed him you know green persimmons and you know, all that kind of stuff? What is it? This guy had bad breakfast or what? What is he? Why is he throwing us this you know all this terrible thing? They just have no idea, and it immediately brings out the thing that's killing him. It's guilt. Can you imagine living that long without getting rid of the guilt? Okay. So what happens here then? It's after three days. Verse 23, so they knew not that Joseph understood them, for he spake unto them through an interpreter. And he turned himself about from them, and what did he do? He what? 
He started crying. Why is he crying? I can understand why he said, serves him right. I get that part. But that's not what he does. He cries. Think about it. We're going to see that again. Okay? So, he sits there and he says, all right, guys. Um, tell you what. And, and so he sits there and says, okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to send everybody back, but somebody has to stay back. Who has to stay back? What do we know about Simeon? Oh, he's cruel. Oh, you bet he is. He and his brother Levi went into Shechem and killed off all of the men because Dinah had been compromised. And the brothers said, well, you know, we want to marry in so that, you know, we will become one people. And uh, they said, this isn't going to happen. And so you have to be circumcised. And while they were recovering, those two boys walked in and killed all the men. And then turned on dad and said, see, that's what we had to do because you did nothing about our sister. That was the accusation. I mean, this, this is, I'm sharing you with this. This is one serious family issues that are just really just, bull- and God's going to be able to pull it together. How? That's the most important part. So, they, they go back and they look. Now, this is funny. He does this twice. <laughs> First time he puts money in the bags, right? Puts their money back in the bags. And they find it. Oh, no. Oh, no. All that kind of stuff. Are you going to want to go back to Egypt? You see? You see this is, he's got them over a barrel. And you go, is he, why is he doing this? It just, and you're all constantly, as you go through the story of Joseph, why is he doing this? Why does he keep doing this? It just seems like it's just driving it into him, just just twisting the nut to make it just tighter and all that kind of stuff. So they come back. We'll just jump ahead here. And they come back. And what do they say? Let's take a look at it. Now, in the meantime, they talk to Dad and, and they come up with a story that's similar but not the same. Okay? And so, but the one thing you do need to know is, is that they have to bring Benjamin. Okay, if they don't bring Benjamin, then they're not going to get anything. Dad says, no, you can't take Benjamin. You've already, you know, we've already lost Joseph. You can't leave the last son of Rachel. You can't do that. Reuben says, I'll take him. The stupidest thing for me, he sat there and he says, well, look, if I don't bring him back, you can kill my two sons. What grandfather is going to kill two grandsons be- so he says, okay, so now I lose you or I lose two, two more grandsons. Well, 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 this is crazy. I don't, I, I don't even know where to go with that one. But that's what he says, and obviously J- Jacob says no. Judah says, now watch what he says here very carefully. He says, I will be the pledge. I will take whatever comes if I don't bring Benjamin back. He's becoming a pledge. I want you to think about that. Okay, I will be a pledge. Okay, so now they start coming and they come back. So starting with chapter 44. Actually, 43, 43 comes in there. And as they come back, I'm, I'm going through the story quickly, but and I'm trying to not, but I, I want to stick with the gospel and I want to stop, stay with the Bible. So I'm getting kind of, there. So anyway, that's where I'm kind of juggling here. They come back and they have the money and they say to the servant, oh, I just want you to know we, we had our money in our bags and so we brought it back and so we have more money to pay for whatever it is that we need to do. And what does the servant say to him? I want you to look at it. That would be Twenty-three, yes. Okay. And it says, Peace be unto you. Fear not. Your God, the God of your father, has given your treasure in your sacks. I had your money. Now, people, do you understand what he just did? I want you to think about this. 
These boys had money in their bags when they left Egypt going home. They didn't do anything. There was no shuffling. There was nothing like that. They just took it there and then they said, okay, well, we need to take those bags and we need to take more bags to go back. He goes up to, to Joseph's servant and he sits there and he says, oh, don't worry about it. I had your money. What do you mean you had our money? We had our money. I mean, this is right in here. We took this all the way back home and brought it all the way back. And you're telling me you had it? And then he says, your God, the God of the, your father gave it to you. You can't tell me that Joseph didn't say this. I think Joseph's behind this. And, and whether or not he's being impish or, or not, I don't think so. I think he's sitting there. He's trying to show them. And he is. He's showing them hospitality. It's just crazy. He comes back and says, don't worry about it. We've got it all taken. And you, you can't tell me that the brothers aren't sweating this thing. When they come back, they're just, just you stole this. And just, oh, no, 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 here's the money, here's the money. You know, you can see it. And then he said, okay, uh, uh, you need to follow me, the servant says. Uh, we're going to go over to Joseph's house and you're going to eat with him. Oriental language, anybody? What do you do? When you want to be friends, you invite him over to your house. Say, you eat at your house, I'm, that's an invitation to friendship. But Egyptians don't eat with other people other than Egyptians. And the brothers are going, what's going on here? And they're freaking out because they, can't, they have no point of reference at all. And you're going, how in the world is this going? The brothers are just up and down emotionally. It's just, wow, well, we got through that. Oh, now there's another thing. Now there's another thing to be worried about. And they just keep going like this. It is, it is. It's this yo-yo and it keeps going back. They sit down to eat and they're looking at an incredible amount of food. Wait a minute. There's Reuben. There's Simeon. There's Levi. There's Jude. How does he know who's the oldest and the youngest? I mean, some of that you could guess at, but he's got us in the, according to our age. And you go, and the other thing is that when they started, then they said, well, wait a minute, Benjamin, whoa. Was he think he's still growing or something like that? I Man, he's got five times more food than we got. Oh, that's okay. I can't eat all the stuff that's surrounding me anyway. So, I mean, do you see all the mixed messages that these brothers are getting? Why? Why it keeps going this way? And you just go, this is crazy. But they don't get upset. They're not mad. <laughs> well, you got food and we got food. And it's, you know, it was no big deal. He says, okay, so now we're finished. So we're going to go back. Whew. Boy, that was really tough going down to Egypt. There's no all these stuff going on, that kind of stuff. So they head on out. And then Joseph says, okay, go catch and bring them back. And they said, and you take a look at it, what it says. And it says, they overtook it says verse 9 in chapter 44 the brothers sit there and they say, hey look, what? You mean somebody stole something? With whomever thy servants be found, let him die, and we shall also be the Lord's bondsmen. And he says, Now let it be according to your words, that he who is found shall be my servant, and you shall be blameless. So in other words, they think that they're going to be all slaves in Egypt. And the servant tells them straight out, No, it's not going to be all of you. It's just going to be one of you, whoever took it. Okay? He will be my slave or he will die. You know, that, you know, that's what they said. They said, let him die, whoever took it. <laughs> they open it up and it's Benjamin. What do you think the brothers are thinking? Oh, this is, oh no, this is, this, this is a nightmare that just won't stop. It just won't stop. And they said, oh no, and they're just thinking everything. I mean, you can just imagine at this point in time, just what, what they're thinking, all that kind of stuff. And so he brings them back. And verse 14, 
And Judah and his brethren came back. Now notice it's Judah that keeps talking because he's the only spokesman. Came to Joseph's house for he was yet there. They fell before him on the ground and Joseph said to them, What deed is this that you have done? Why, why did you not know that I was such a man as I would certainly be able to divine? They're thinking, this guy is absolutely a scary guy. He knows the future. He knows everything. He's like God. And they're struggling with all of this kind of stuff. And then, um, he speaks up, and he's, and starting with verse 16, and Judah says, here it is. Now, why is it Judah? Why is it Judah? Listen very carefully. And that is, he says, and Judah said, what shall we say unto my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how shall we clear ourselves? God has found out the iniquity of thy servants. And behold, we are my Lord's servants, both we and he who the cup is found. What sin are they talking about? Joseph, you're absolutely right. This is 17 years after the last, you know, after the last time they saw Joseph. And they, I'm sorry? They thought he was dead. Now he's there, but they don't know he's alive. They don't know. But here's the point. This is what guilt does. This is what guilt does. They are now starting to see. And what are they most afraid of for anything? More than anything else, what are they afraid of? That's part of it. What's the other part? Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Do you see that? It's what they did to their father. I'm going to stop for just a second. Who have we sinned against? God. Our Heavenly Father. And what took it to get us back? The death of his son. Now, I think we have a parallel, a similarity. A foreshadowing is the best word I could use. Joseph is seen as a fore, foreknowledge, something that's pointing to. He's an archetype that sometimes use the word. To where you sit there and you say, you know what, I've heard this story before. And then you realize, but it's Jesus. But it's happening to Joseph and his brothers and all of those kinds of situations. And I'm suggesting that this is foreshadowing what Jesus is going to have to do to bring the whole world together. As Joseph, God through Joseph, brings the most dysfunctional family that he has come to and said, you will be a blessing to all nations. And they have no clue what that's going to be like the way that they've been acting. And you go, all right, so you want to talk about a challenge, God? You've got it right here. And Joseph is right in the middle of it. And you say, well, wh how is he going to do all of this kind of stuff? And you start looking at it. And he says, and they said, God has found out. God has found out our iniquities. And verse 17, Joseph comes back and says, God forget that I should do so. But the man whose hand is cut is found, he shall be my servant. And as for you, you can go in peace to your father. He actually is showing mercy. He says, well, you could kill us all. You could do all that. No, I'm not going to do that. You know, just the person needs to know that you just don't steal things from somebody like me. So therefore, he's just going to stay and the rest of you guys go home. And then, this is where the most powerful thing comes in. Then Judah came near to him, and he says, O oh my Lord, let thy servant, I pray thee, speak a word in my Lord's ear. And let not thine anger burn against thy servant, for thou art even as Pharaoh, as God. Joseph, Judah sees this. He says, man, you're, just, you're as powerful as God, for all I know, and all that kind of situation. My Lord asked his servants, saying, Have you a father or a brother? And we said unto my Lord, We have a father, an old man, a child of his old age, a little one, and his brother is... Yep. Now, what does that tell Joseph? 
He didn't know that. So in other words, he just found out just now that his brothers told dad that he must have died. So dad thinks I'm dead. Boy, this is going to get a shock. <laughs> okay, so you see what's happening there. Okay, so then he c- continues on. And then he says, and he alone is left of his... So he's talking about Benjamin. He says, Benjamin is alone, is left of his mother, and his father loved him. They are not talking about Benjamin. They're talking about how they're treated their father. And I find that very significant. Because my sins are not against you. They're sin against my father, and then they're about you. See the difference? My sin is against God. And then how I translate it is how I treat people. My first sin is against God. Then it just, unfortunately, you get some of the residue of that stuff. And that's the kind of stuff that's happening. Okay, so now here's the thing. And you said to your, uh, bring him down that we, I might see his eyes. That we might, and we said to my Lord, the Lord cannot leave his father. For if he should leave his father, his father would die. Have we ever thought about John 3.16 where it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his son to die? Do we think of it in those terms? We say, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Okay? But I don't think we stop and sit there and say, To die for people like us. Sometimes we don't think that way. And so you start... You know, realizing what's going on. He says, And thou said to your servants, Except you bring your youngest brother come down to us, you will not see my face anymore. So it came to pass when we came up to our, our servant, thy servant, my father, we told him the words of the Lord. And our father said, Go again and buy some food. And we said, We cannot go down if the youngest doesn't come with us. And then we will go down, for we will not see the man's face except the youngest brother's with us. And thy servant, my father, said to us, What? You know that my wife bear me two sons. Wait a minute here. My wife? Yeah, his wife. But what about Leah? She's a wife. You see what's happening here? And all of a sudden it start putting all of the stuff together and treating it as family. And so it gets a little bit more. And it says, my, uh, that my wife bear me two sons. And the one went out from me, and I said, Surely he is torn to pieces, and saw him not since. So in other words, now he knows, he says, Dad thinks that I was destroyed by a, a wild animal. Who was the wild animal that actually did it? The brothers. I mean, you got to realize just what this is really co- communicating to Joseph. And surely he's torn to pieces, and I saw him not hence. And if you take this away from me, my, and mischief befall him, you shall bring down my gray hairs and sorrow to the grave. Now therefore, when I come to thy servant, my father, and the laid, lad be not with us, seeing that his life is bound up in the lad's life, it shall come to pass that when he sees that his lad is not with us, he will die. Just keep your finger right there and go to Genesis 37. And take a look at the last verse, and if somebody could read that, that would really be great. Last verse of chapter 37. And the Midianites sold him into Egypt unto Potiphar, and an officer of the Pharaohs and the captain of the guard. 37? 36? 37. Oh, chapter 37, right? Yeah. The last verse where it talks about how the father responded. That's not it. Um, 35. 35. Verse 35. Oh, verse 35. Thank you. Go ahead, Deborah. I'll start with 34. And Jacob rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his loins and mourned for his son many days. And all his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted and said, for I will go down into the grave unto my son mourning. Thus his father went wept for him. Okay. They couldn't... Now, to me, Judah leaves this. He says, I can't stay at home. I can't stand it. 
because I know what we're responsible for doing to dad. Do we? Do we know what we've done to our Heavenly Father? Have we even thought about it? And you and I have the opportunity to be treated as kindly as Joseph treated his brothers. Because watch what happens here. He sits there and he says, seeing that the life is bound up, it shall come to pass, he will die. It says, for verse 32, for thy servant became the surety for the lad unto my father, saying, if I bring him not unto you, then I shall bear the blame to my father forever. Are you hearing echoes? Isn't this what Jesus did for you and me? Did he not become our pledge? But God did it with his eyes open. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And you go, he deliberately chose to allow Jesus. When you read desire, is it? No. Is it? No. I believe it's in Patriarchs and Prophets. Ellen White makes a very interesting comment. This did not come easy. This did not come. Oh, yeah, go ahead. You know, we'll, we'll give you a few years. You know, it's just eternity. You know, no, no big deal. That's not what happened. You need to realize that in both cases, both God and Christ weighed what, was gonna, what it was going to cost. They knew. And I think sometimes we forget that. And so when you start realizing that he says, okay, I will be the surety. Okay? Do you realize what he said? Now watch what happens here. He says, I will be, blame, I, I shall bear the blame to my father forever. Now therefore I pray thee, let thy servant abide here instead of the lad, a bondman to the my Lord, and let the lad go to be with his brethren. For how shall I go up to my father and the lad not be with me, lest peradventure I shall see the evil that shall come upon my father. Do you realize what Judah said? Do you realize that he sat there and he says, I can't do this. I will not, I will not allow this. I will take his place. Does that sound familiar? Is there not an echo here? This is Jesus. This is Jesus. This is, it's not perfect. It can't be perfect because he's not God. But as close as humanly possible, Judah is showing that he has been converted. And it was converted because he realized what he had done to his father when he did. And then he realized, oh, wait a minute, I know what I feel like in my situation. How dare that I would have done it to my father. And then the most amazing thing happens. Joseph could not refrain himself before all them that stood before him and he cried. He cried, people. He cried and cried. Why? He cried because he said, it's over with. That's it. I can't take any more. My brothers have changed. So heaven, uh, home is safe for us. Do you realize what that is? The rejoicing. And they have no clue. I mean, think about it. They see this man who is literally, in their minds, tortured them <laughs> through all kinds of stuff. And they don't realize that the only way that they would appreciate their family and their home and, and accept dad and everybody that was there, they would do it because he's doing it because he loves us. And this is where we struggle. I don't think we talk about this. I believe that what Joseph was doing is he had to do what he did. The only way he, that he could prove to himself that in that particular case, he needed to know the quality of his brothers as to whether or not home was, should I go home? Otherwise he could sit there and say, forget it, I'll just go home. And I, I, I'll never see my brothers again. I'll stay in Egypt and they can do whatever they want and I'll just, I'll be there. But when Judas started saying this, that I think got it because I believe that what Judas said, just it broke it for Joseph. He says, I can't do this anymore. I cannot. I've got to tell them who I am. 
And that scared the living daylights out of him. And he starts crying because they don't know why he's crying. They have no clue. I'm sitting here. How many times have there been these surprises here? And you look at this and you see how this happens. And you start recognizing a love that just is unbelievable. And you realize that Joseph was walking this fine line. He had to find out the truth, but he had to do it in love. And it just, people outside of that, not understanding what he's like, would sit there and say, I don't know. But then when he starts crying, then they say, what's happening here? And then he says it. He wept out loud. The Egyptians in the house of Pharaoh heard him. I don't know what that's like. I don't know how close they were or whatever, but they heard about it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Does my father still live? I find that very poignant. What did Jesus say on the cross? Turn in your Bibles to Psalms chapter 22. It's quoted for us. You know what it is. You've seen it before. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You can't tell me that Jesus didn't experience the stuff that those brothers did. Because he died in our place. That's where we should have been. That's where we should have been. But it wasn't until he was able to find out if his brothers had changed. Was there any hope for a home? And then all of a sudden you see it. And now the brothers are scared. Because Joseph has all the power. <laughs> and then... Notice how... No ego. Listen to this. Verse 4, chapter 45. Come near to me, I pray thee. And they came near. And finally he says, I am Joseph, your brother. I'm the one that you sold into Egypt. Now therefore, be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that you sold me hither. And listen to this. For God did send me before you to preserve life. All of this thing about the investigative judgment, I think, personally, is what Joseph basically did. He needed to see whether or not that's really where you wanted to be. He was looking for a commitment. A commitment to believe that his father's house was the best place to be. In my father's house for many mansions. I want it to be with you, but do you, are you going to enjoy this? You know, or are you not? You know, and, and the world has to sit there and say, oh, you know, I'm, like I said earlier, angels say, hey, you're bringing these guys back here? Don't you know what they've been doing for centuries? You really want to bring them back up here? And when they see that, they, and he's just answered it for the universe. He says, these guys belong here. They've changed. They're different. They're not the same people. And that makes heaven safe. Now, yes, there's going to be a lot of stuff happening in the last days, just like it did according to Matthew 24, is that it was in the days of the flood. And the days of the flood had to do with unchecked sin. And and there, now watch what Joseph finally ends up saying as he continues this. Verse 6, for these two years there's a famine. And verse 7, God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you that sent me hither, but God. I don't know how he says that. He's 17 years old. He's, go, he's going down to be a slave in, in a country that's so far away from home. He's, uh, there's no chance he's going to be seen. He's not going to do anything like that at all. And yet, and yet he turns around and says, no, God brought me not once, three times he's, he'll say things like this. He says, God brought me down to save you. Nobody, including Joseph, had any clue that that's what his dreams meant. Now, if that is the case then, 
then if the, if the investigative judgment has, has to find out whether or not we are on one side or the other side, it has to do with something of a change of heart. It's not performance. It's not performance. It includes performance because true faith works by love. So all God has ever asked us to do, and it sounds really trite, but it isn't now. Believe me. When I tell you something, believe that I'm telling you the truth. Follow my instructions. Do that stuff. And if you need help, I'll do that. I do that. You read through the whole Bible, and how many times does God help people to do the right thing? All the time. So therefore, this isn't about, okay... Cross his arms, he said, okay, you know, you do it. You know what the rule says, do it. If you don't do it, well, you know, whatever, you know. I mean, I'd really like to have you go, but the bottom line is, is, you know, if you don't meet the standard, well, I guess you don't get to go. How many times have we heard something like that and think that that's the way that God's going to judge the world? I don't think so. Am I wrong? Does this, does this sound weird or are we talking about a, a God that really understands and loves us? That's where I'm at. So what have I been saying all along here? Should we be afraid? No, we should be concerned. We sit there and say, Lord, what would you have me to do? What do I need now? What, what, what is it? The one thing that I hope that we've learned is what it means to truly believe in God. That's all this thing is. This is simple. But we haven't been seeing it because we see more of the rational law and not seeing the emotions of a story of a father and his children. And you can't have one or the other by itself. They both have to come together before you see the whole picture. And then you realize, yeah, there's a place for law, there's a place for grace, there's a place for this. And it all comes down to, you know, Psalms put it this way, where Law and love kiss together. And I'm I'm paraphrasing here, but you know what I'm referring to. Justice and mercy kiss together. You've got to put those two together. Otherwise, we're going to be sending out the wrong message to the world about getting ready for Christ to come and at the same time, probably turn them away because they sit there and say, well, you know, you've got all these rules. Yeah, but that's not what they're there for. Oh, they're guidance. There's, there's no, and, and they're, they're real. But if you don't have the connection with God, it's not going to mean anything. Yes? I've always thought since I've been an Adventist when it, finally, when it finally came to my brain and my soul, the John 14, 15. Jesus says, If you love me, keep my commandments. So you do it because you love Him. Because He's your Savior and He died on the cross for your sins. So that's the motivation to keep the law. Not to be saved. Because He saved you. And you want to do it for Him. But we need to know how to do that. And that's something that God teaches us on a day-to-day basis. Yeah, Notice we're not changing anything that we've ever said. The emphasis is now on God as opposed to on me getting all the right things done in the right way and all that kind of stuff. But to me, it takes the legalism aspect out of the picture. It, it takes out legalism and shows the proper place of the law as an instructor. This is what God called it. I says, I gave them a law to instruct them. Not sit there and do all those, those other kind of things. But I, like I said, when we do this, then we, I'll be honest, and, I, and maybe I'm stepping on toes here, but sometimes we sit there and talk more about all the terrible things that are going to be happening in the end. And you say, well, in other words, what's going to happen is, is that what was in, in the time of the flood before the flood is going to happen again. God wasn't responsible for that. That's what, that simply shows the true identity of sin in people's lives. And that's how they treat people. Anyway. Oh, yes, please. The law. 
Yep. Rules and regulations. For a long time, I have thought of it as his character. Not a law. It's how I live. How I carry myself. He says, follow me. Let's do it the same way. So I think it's, it's, it's much more enjoyable to, to, to think that we're trying to come somewhat closer to his character than following rules. That's right. And I think that, that quite frankly, we, you know, I, you know, Seventh-day Adventists aren't the only ones that can be legalists. <laughs> I'm serious, come on, people. Everybody can do that. But the bottom line is, is that I want us to realize, don't we have a gracious, loving God? Have we seen Him today like maybe we haven't seen Him in areas of our lives that we haven't seen there before? I hope so. But I'll tell you that there's a whole bunch of young people out there that have no clue. They do not see this. They do not. And they walk out or they do whatever it is or they just, they don't see the, the need for it or all of those kinds of things. And I'll tell you what, when we start seeing it this way, then if we start showing that fruit because of what we believe and the, the mind of Christ, they're going to say, well, wait a minute, I thought that. And I'm going to use an illustration that will surprise you. Ladies, there is nothing more controversial than Genesis chapter 3 where God says that you will submit yourselves to your husbands. As, you know, and, and we read Ephesians 5 and they go through that. And I'll tell you, the first time that I shared that in my class, my kid, the girls just went bonkers, man. They were all over me like crazy. I said, take a look at Ephesians 5. Take a look at what it says there. And they said, no, no, that's not going to happen. Boy, they were, they were all that kind of stuff. I said, wait a minute here, before you make that. And so I said, I'm going to show you a film. And I encourage you to see it. It's put out by Hallmark. It is one of their earlier ones. It's called The Magic of Ordinary Days. And you've probably never seen it, but I would recommend it highly. Magic of Ordinary Days. And it's about a girl whose father is a minister during World War II and she is supposed to take care of her dying mother because dad isn't there and sister's gone and she just, she loses it. She just, you know, I have to watch my mother die and all that kind of stuff and she had nobody. So she threw her arms in the first arms that would accept her and ended up pregnant and dad says, well, you know, you, you, you know, made your bed, now you got to lie in it. So he works it out to where she goes out in the middle of nowhere in the farmland and marries a guy sight unseen. And the way that that young man treats her blows her away. And I'm not going to say anymore because I don't want to spell it. Well. I want you to see it. It is absolutely stunning. After I showed the film, I turned to the girls, uh, to the class, and I said, okay, so what would happen if Ray, the boy that was in the thing, who married this girl and, and treated her like amazing, if he walked through that door and he was going to be a classmate of yours in this classroom, and six girls turned immediately and said, you leave him alone, he's mine. <laughs> and the boys, and we just... What is that? What is it? What, what would happen here? And the boys, that they had no clue. Oh, they did. They just were whatever. And I said, tell us, girls. He says, if that's what it means for a husband to love his wife as Christ loved the church, I have no problem submitting to my husband. And every single year that I do this, I start out with Ephesians 5, and the girls are about ready to hang me in the hallways. And I sat there and I said, no, you watch this film. And I even had guys say, man, that guy really knows how to treat that woman. He really does. I said, guys, are you taking notes? I mean, come on. 
You know, there's no reason for this stuff. And the girls sit there and says, man, read it. And every single year, the girls said, if that's the way that what it means, how God loved the church, and that's how a husband's supposed to love his wife, then here's our problem. All we've done is that we look at Ephesians 5 and it starts out first saying, wives, submit yourself to your husbands. So we think that's what comes first. But guess what? It doesn't because guess what 1 John says? We love because he first loved us. Well, if we're supposed to love our wives like Christ loved the church, then husbands, it's on us first. And if we show them the love of God, then there's not a problem. I think we've been doing the same thing with church. We think that, you know, we, we, we think, well, it's, it's, it's got to be the other way. Yeah, and the point is, is that we're not seeing how God loves us. So we're not responding like that. We haven't really understood God's love. We talk about it, but we don't take the time to dwell on it and to explore it in such a way as we've done a little bit this weekend. But I hope and I pray that you have seen God in ways you have never seen him before. Not because that's a bad thing. It's just all I want is, is to, to hear that Pittsburgh Church is on fire for the right reasons. And they have a message to give to the world that will turn hearts to them and hearts to God. That's my prayer. So pastor, this is, this is what is there. And I, I hope and I pray that this continues. It's just been a really great thing to be here. I thank you for your hospitality. I thank you for your, for your attention and your patience. But this is something that just lays heavy on my heart, that God gets what he deserves. So anyway, yes, please. Oh, by all means, please. Sure. Um. Yeah, I really appreciate um, the things you're sharing. I wrote a few things down in, in thoughts uh, that occurred. Okay, good. Uh, so, yeah, I'd like to share. Um, so, one interesting thing I see here is the brother saying, you know, his blood is, is required of us. So I thought, well, is the blood required of them? And I, I would say it is. Um, and, and that's actually the beauty in the story, I think, is because because Joseph is alive, the blood doesn't have to be required of them. Like, it, the whole situation with, with Benjamin being taken, um, you know, Joseph, his dad thinks he's gone. You know, they, they are guilty they're weighed down by it and there is a price to pay for that but Joseph, the, the fact is is that Joseph is alive and that he's taking care of it much like Jesus has dealt with the sin problem because um, all, all he wanted was to rescue sinners right yeah so you know they were worried about it and, and rightly so because they did something wrong well, yeah but it was taken care of by Joseph. So that's, that's, what, that's what I was seeing. And, and the, notice the parallel yeah. with Christ. And, and, and that's good. Anything else? Yeah. Please. Yeah. Um, and so even in that, I see the, the tension between, in the meeting between mercy and justice. Um, a, a question uh, I have here is, you know, why was it difficult for the father to give Jesus? And I think like, I mean, if God knows he can take care of sin, why is it an issue for him to send Jesus? I, and I'm, I might have an answer if anyone else wants to say, you know, you're, you're welcome to too. Why was it difficult for... for well, why don't you go ahead and, and, and give us what you think? Yeah, um, uh, I see it as God himself managing the tension between uh, justice and mercy. That is, is maybe why it's difficult because he knows he knows about the sin issue, and that rightly so, a, a race of sinners you know, shouldn't live in existence. But at the same time, he wants to bring them back, like we see with Joseph. He is seeking actively to 
rescue his brothers, rescue humanity. So the difficulty for God may have come in the balancing of, of justice and mercy. I think that's part. Uh, yeah, no, no, I, yeah. I don't disagree with that. On the other hand, um, and I mean by other hand, is the idea, I think there's some more that's involved here. And the reason why is because what we don't understand is Jesus said something very interesting. If you've seen me, you've seen the, you've Father. Seen the Father. Okay, now, here's the point. We assume, we treat God traditionally and ignorantly as somebody who's stoic and has no emotions at all. And yet we're created as emotional beings. If we're to say that we're created in the image of God, then God has, imi- that God has emotions. He has those kinds of situations. And so therefore, I think it, it cost him. It cost him deeply to watch his son die as he did by the hands of the people that he created. And I think that's really important for us to understand. Now, he's only doing that because he's got to show the end result. One of the things, it's not the only thing, but the one thing it is, he says, he says, there is absolutely no way. I, because here's the point, and this is what I said with Cain and Abel. When you looked at those four bars that went across, you know, the blue and the red bars that, in the chart, um, I don't have it here with me. No, I don't. Okay, anyway, there was the thing. Uh, for Adam and Eve, it was nakedness, which led to fear, which led to guilt, and then led to blame. Okay? But with Cain... With those two, just those two generations, they went to the gamut. Because here it starts out with jealousy, then it starts out with hatred, then it starts out with contempt, and it ends up in murder. I'm suggesting that with those two generations, they go all the way from nakedness to murder. And for us to understand that if we had a chance as sinners we would ultimately find ourselves wanting to kill God. Mm-hmm. As Cain, I think, honestly did. That's, that's where we, He couldn't do that. He knew he couldn't do that. But that, that's where his hate was towards. He hated Abel because he remembered, he reminded him of what God does, what God is. And so I see that. And so therefore, it is the emotions. You know, cause, and the reason why is because John 3.16 says, For God... So love the world. You can't love without realizing what isn't love and, and emotionally react to it. So I don't think that that's what you're trying to, to, to take away. I'm just simply saying I would tack that onto what you said because I think that both those, those things fit. But, and I'll be honest, I think both of us are still not getting half of it, okay? Well, there's, there's always more. Yeah, yeah there's always yeah. more. But, but that's more than what we had yesterday. And that's good. Yeah. I also think that as parents, ah, yes, it would be extremely hard. You know, son. Yep. And no matter what you want to do, you'll give you everything you have to save yep. me. And I don't think we understand that. I know. I realize that. And you know what happens when we do realize it? We either want him dead or we'll do whatever it takes to be close to that person and realize that heaven is worth it all to be in the presence of God. I think that's why God found it so hard. Yeah. Is because he loved us. Yes. As we love kids. Yes. And knowing how many could, could be lost. Yes, you're right. And, and as soon as you do that, as soon as you do that, you start recognizing that the love constraineth us. For we thus judge, if one died for all, then all are dead. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18. It is, you know, you know, for we thus judge that if one died for all, then all are dead. 
We need to recognize that Jesus died. He did what you and I couldn't do because we're already sinners. He sat there and he says, I'm showing you who I am and my Father. And when you see the love of God, then you sit there and you say, why in the world did I do this? I, I did not take that into consideration, Eve would say, and because I thought it was about me. And it wasn't. It's about Him. Please. I, I want to tag on to the comment. The first one I think that somebody brought up here about um, the brothers feeling um, responsible uh-huh. um, to, to pay the price. I wrestled with the thing about, okay, so if Jesus takes my guilt on him, yet I still feel a responsibility for him being on the cross. I still feel some sense of guilt for that. But that's where I I find comfort in Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. And the life I now live, I live because of him. That's right. And then I add on to that Paul's words in Romans 12.1. To give ourselves as a living sacrifice, which is our reasonable service. God isn't unreasonable here. When I put, when he takes my guilt, any sense of responsibility I feel for the fact that he had to die, I can now express as a living sacrifice. I'm still on that cross with him. Yep. So every day that I live, I'm living it for him. And that helps me deal with the sense of responsibility that I still feel for putting him there in the first place. Yep. And that's what's going to make me love him and hopefully make me safe to be in heaven. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. That's that's been there. Um Where is it? I got to See if I can find it here. In Romans, it talks about Christ is our propitiation. And I want to explain that in... And I'm trying to remember it. My my head is starting to atrophy here on me. But it comes out... Let's see, it's... Is it four? Oh, come on. I put that in right. I know it is in my other Bible, but it's not here for some strange reason. I'm not... Finding it. It says that Christ was our propitiation. And there's a lot of people that say that Jesus had to convince God. In other words, God says, I need to see somebody die. And if it's not them, then I guess you're going to do that. And, uh, and the problem with that is this. If that is the case, then that basically portrays God as being no different than we are. And yet many churches, many people believe that kind of stuff. Some people sit there and they say that this propitiated um, other things. But I would suggest that Christ was showing us. He died for us that would change us. Not God. Not Satan. Satan, you know, you can't sit... There are people who say that Christ died to pay... Satan, so that he could have us instead. I'm serious. I'm, I'm, it's there. When people sit there and say, well, he died to, to convince God to take us back. No, he died to convince us how much he loved us and was willing to sacrifice, to show us the real way of how to live and, and, and how that makes a difference. And this is something that... that these are things that we need to kind of shore up because if we don't then we send the wrong message and this is how some of the stuff that we've talked about today 
got uncovered and go, whoa, wait a minute, this is a good piece of news. This, I like this. This is good. This is making it. I'm being, you know, very modest with that. I mean, this is, this is what turns the world upside down when you start realizing this kind of stuff. Anybody else, please? I don't want to draw this out. I just simply want to give opportunity to people. I hope this has been a blessing to you. I hope that this has given you insights that you can go back and study. If you find something I'm interested, you can talk to Carl. He'll get it to me. I know that. But the point being is, is that we're, I, I, don't, I don't teach in the classroom anymore. But more importantly, I see so many people that are sitting in the pews and I'm going, I'm, I know I'm here, but there, there's got to be more than what I'm doing here. There has to be something that's more. And all of a sudden you go, really? That's good news. Yes. I disagree with your statement. You don't teach anymore. All right. What all you, I was saying you, was I do? don't teach in our classes anymore. As, as, what are you yes. going to be doing Friday night? Oh, What am I doing Friday night? This coming Friday night. This coming Friday night? I uh, he's, Actually, he's I'm, be teaching teaching. A, I'm teaching at a home Bible study. And, that's my point. Yeah. You you can't you can't take the teacher out of the teacher. No. And I I'm not trying. I'm I, being I know facetious with you. We go back and forth. It's, it, we we have fun. No, we're good. But anyway. But here's our point. I want I want for people to finally recognize the joy that can come when we come into a place like this and make it that kind of a thing that people would want to be here because I've never heard a message and the reason why I'm go- and I'm going to stop with this and you guys do whatever you want with it one of the things that this church does not teach is the immortality of the soul now what that means is is that you got to realize when people die the average answer is they either go to heaven or they go to hell or if they're Catholic they could possibly go to uh, purgatory but guess what that means nobody dies nobody dies now watch this this is scary what that means is Jesus didn't die either Do you see that? See, that's what's hiding under all of this stuff. If Jesus didn't really die, you say, well, wait a minute. Yeah, he did die on the cross. Well, hey, wait a minute here. He's on the cross from 9 until 3 in the afternoon. And I can tell you people who have been tortured as badly as Christ was physically, who've lived a lot longer and put up with more torture than that ever been. But that's not the death that Jesus died. Jesus died the death that every single sinner who chooses to refuse God's gracious offer. And they're going to receive, let's say, hey, I don't want to be around God. Okay, well then what's left? You see, that's the whole point. And so what the, the, the thing is, is that then what did Jesus really do? Okay, all we can say is, well, he died on a cross and that was terrible. But how many other people died on a cross? Do you know why they broke their legs? Because they could stay up there for weeks. And suffocate, suffocate, yes. But again, they could be, there were those that they would be, because you could put your feet like this, and they went right through the spike, you know, they went right through your ankle like this, and you're hanging like this, and you'd push up, but every time you pushed up, you know what your feet felt like? Oh, yeah. And you're sitting there like this, and I have my kids do this, and they go, man, this is just hurting right now, just the way I'm standing. I said, that's how they hung. And and I sat there and I said, so why would he do that? Well, that's terrible. Yes, that's right. No, but if if, could you hang on from nine to five, nine to three? You see, this is this is not making any sense here. Jesus died the second death. That's what brought out great tears of blood. His body is literally disintegrating in the garden. That's what's happening. He's going to die of a broken... His heart literally breaks. It just, it just can't stand the stress anymore. It just cannot. Physically. And he had no way. He had no way that he was going to make it out. 
This is into thy hands, I commend my servant. Whatever it is, I'm in your hands. He is always submitted to the will of his Father. But to sit there and say that Jesus, you know, just died for nine to three, and then he went to either heaven or hell or purgatory, you know, I mean, it doesn't make any difference. That's nothing. Which is? The dead know nothing. Yeah. To actually be, to have no brain function, brain wave at all in death. That's why, they, that's why all these other preachers push them on up into heaven. That way, I was taught as a kid, my grandmother's watching me from heaven. I better be a good boy. I know. I hear that. But you see, what I want to focus on is this. You know, I, I used to do that too until I realized what had happened. And that is that if you believe in the immortality of the soul, then you take away the one thing that Jesus came to show. He says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. See, and the point is, is that, well, I only lent you for, for 33 years. I only lent him for just a little bit. And then he gets to go to heaven. He says, okay, well, I did my part. It doesn't work that way. He gave up eternity for you and me to show us and things like, yes, please. I would, n not to be contrary in any, in any way, but if Jesus died the second death, then he wouldn't have resurrected. Because the second death is only designed for those who are eternally dead. Okay. So I would, I, I, there's, you know, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of controversy between these, but we can say he might have experienced it, but he didn't die it, otherwise he wouldn't have been our Savior, and he couldn't have resurrected. Because in Revelation, it's pretty clear, the second death is designed for those who cannot and will not be resurrected because of their sin. No, I, and I understand, and, and maybe I didn't make myself clear here because you know you're, I, I'm following what you're saying. But the other thing is that the, it, the, the t term is used: the tomb could not hold him because he the, there was no sin. Because he's life. Okay. Yes, yeah. I understand that. But he truly died. You know, and ex if you want to use the word experience, would that work for you? That he experienced the second death. Felt like what it would feel like to die the second death. Because I, 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 see, here's where we're playing the games with words. Okay, I think I understand what you're getting at behind that, and and I, I agree with you. So we're on the same thing here. Words are really difficult, and this is the reason why I immediately from the very beginning of this thing last night, I talked about the idea of how words, theological words, are as flexible as rubber. It just, it's so easy to just say, well, I mean this by this word or whatever it is like that. And when you see the stories, then the stories give meaning to the words when they're used to describe the, 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 the story. And that is the only way I know how to do it better than what we usually do it. So, yeah, I, I wouldn't argue with that. It's just, you know, I understand what you're saying. And, and if I can find some words that make that happen, it's just that, I'm sorry, theologians are like scientists. We come up with all these weird stuff and, and, and doctors will come up, they come up with all these weird you know, words for new medicines and all that stuff and theology, the Hilgeschacht and the Kerygma and all this other kind of stuff that we play with. And, I, and it's not a bad thing, it's just that we're not communicating. And that's what I don't want us to fall into. So thank you so much for doing that. On a, on a positive note, when you were talking about Judah, as being a type, mm -hmm. Jesus came from the line of Judah. Oh, I know. Isn't that kind of interesting? And ladies, interesting? you want to see something really interesting? Turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 1. Turn to Matthew chapter 1. This is really kind of cool. Okay? Matthew chapter 1. And you're going to find four women. You're going to find four women in the genealogy of Jesus. The first one is? Nope. It is not. Nope, it's not. He's not there either. Who's the first one? It's Rahab, isn't it? Nope. 
It's Tamar. It's Judah's child that comes right after that. Phares is Judah's son by Tamar. Okay? The next one is Rahab. And who was she? She was a prostitute in Jericho who married a a man from the tribe of Judah. Are you ready for this one? Who's the third woman? Ruth. Do you know who Ruth is? Okay, Boaz is is Rahab's son. Did you know that? Yeah. Okay. And then, and then, um, so that's the Judah, and then there is Ruth, who was married to a Benjaminite, and the and who is the great grandson of Ruth? David. David is a mix of Benjamin and Judah. And what's really interesting is, is that if you talk to the Jewish rabbis, they'll sit there and say, "Very interesting." Who's supposed to be in the line of, who's, who's supposed to be king? The, the, the kingdom, the scepter will not pass from Judah, right? Who's the first king? Yeah. Yes, he's a Benjaminite. Okay, now watch this. David shows up. He comes from the tribe of Judah. And Jonathan takes off his coat and gives it to David and the Jews say that what happened was that was something that pointed out the fact that Judah had stepped in for Benjamin and Benjamin was returning the favor and says no the scepter belongs to you Judah That's that's how the Jews take that my point that I want to make is is that everything is connected And when you read through these stories like this, you need to watch what has happened in the past and you'll know what's going to happen in the future. Because even in Revelation, it it lists the the 12 tribes. And guess who's first? It's not Reuben, the oldest. That's right. It's Judah. Uh, I'm going to see if I can't. Are you kidding me? Well, I had a graphic that I wanted to show you. It shows a boy that's sitting in a rowboat, and it explains that whole concept. And I'll see if I can't copy off that and then send a copy if you want to understand that. But that's how we do that, and it's just all over the place. And so when I talk to the rabbis and things like that, they'll say, well, see, it's over here. And, there. and it's just like there's only two places in the whole Bible, in the whole Hebrew Bible, that says these phrases... And it's not. And that's the reason why the Jews cannot believe that many people, you know, wrote the, you know, the different things. There's like four letters, you know, the, the L, I can't even remember them. I just, you know what I'm talking about, though. The, the different, L, uh, the, the E, the J, the, all of these different people wrote different parts. And they, the, yeah, and they put it all together, and I'm sitting there going, "Uh, oh, can't do that," because you can't make these chiastic structures like we see, and and have different people adding it in and back and forth and all that kind of stuff, and that and so when you do that, you'll say, "Hey, wait a minute, that reminds me of stuff." Yeah, there it is, and and they do this all the time. So, the last thing, and I'm sorry, I I like Beethoven. Have you ever listened to Beethoven's Symphony? You think he's going to stop? And then he starts going off. He goes on a, on a, on a, on a, a, a sixth chord and then, whoosh, and then he goes off in another place. Well, I'm going to try to stop it. But anyway, here's the, here's the last thing. Go for it. Huh? Okay. All right. Jesus says, come and need to me, all you are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And we go, oh, that's really nice. The Pharisees are pulling their hair out. They are absolutely beside themselves. 
And you go, how do you know? He says, because they know where that phrase comes from. It comes from Jeremiah. And if you look at it in Jeremiah, you look two verses above it, who's speaking? God. And the Pharisees are beside themselves. This man is claiming to be God. And nobody else knows it. And the Pharisees are ticked beyond whatever it is that you do that. And they know and they won't tell. And they want to sit there and and they try to make Jesus look bad. And he does this. He uses the illusions. He quotes Old Testament texts. He says, that was me. You look at how many times he does that. He says, there's no excuse for not knowing me. Yes, please. And there it is. Absolutely, yeah. So, you know, it's, and so that's where Jesus sits there and it's just driving these guys nuts. And the reason why is because he's, he's simply just saying, I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not putting down on you. It's just, hey, you knew why I was coming. <laughs> There's no reason why you didn't know why I was coming, but, you know, whatever. People, I want to thank you again for your hospitality. Thank you for your interest. Thank you for your comments. And I will be asking for prayers for you, for this church, that you will take what you've heard that is good here and start sharing with people that have no clue. It makes all the difference in the world when you see God as He really is. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your presence here.